Comparisons of the size of the Indian and European populations as of the early generations after Columbus can be misleading, however, insofar as such comparisons suggest that there was a simple race war for possession of the hemisphere. Neither the Indians nor the whites were united, so that both alliances and battles took place across racial lines. Many Indians allied themselves with the newcomers in warfare against other Indians, for revenge against erstwhile Indian conquerors and oppressors, or to share in the spoils of war, or to gain other advantages. Similarly, the Europeans fought among themselves for a variety of reasons and had Indian allies against fellow Europeans. The British and French, for example, clashed repeatedly in battle in North America, as they did around the world, and both had Indian allies in these battles. In addition, there were simple European versus European battles, as there were Indian versus Indian battles. The Dutch sent a naval squadron to attack the British settlement in Virginia, and the British government under Cromwell sent expeditionary forces to colonial America to force the surrender of royalist governments in various British colonies on the North American continent and in the Caribbean. In South America, rival contingents of Spaniards fought among themselves over the spoils of the Incan Empire and, when much of this treasure was shipped off to Spain, British privateers waited on the high seas to intercept it. In short, colonial-era rivalries and alliances were not based on race, but on expediency. In 1701, a letter written by a British colonial official spoke of the Iroquois Indians to the West as the only barrier against the French forces, including the Indian allies of the French. As late as the first few decades of the newly created United States, Major military battles between whites and Indians remained rare in this part of the hemisphere, certainly as compared to the hundreds of battles per decade that would later occur in the United States after the middle of the nineteenth century, when a now vastly larger white population sought far more land and had both the numbers and the military equipment to take it. Even during this later era, however, much of the land transfer from Indians to whites in the United States was through what might be called semi-conquest as the American government paid millions of dollars to Indians for their land, but only about half of what that land would bring in the market. Many of the conquests of the Western Hemisphere were not like the conquests of modern Europe, where one organized state attacks another militarily, and after defeating it on the battlefield, takes over its territory and its sovereignty over the people living there. Many of the early European conquests in the Western Hemisphere were a series of uncoordinated campaigns by fighting units operating under the general auspices of the governments of Spain or Portugal, but by no means always under the effective direction or control of rulers or officials on the other side of the Atlantic. Given the slowness of communications in the era of wind-driven ships, news of what was being done in the name of Spain or Portugal often reached the Iberian Peninsula long after it was a fait accompli. Even Spanish viceroys in the Western Hemisphere could lose control of the situation some distance away, as both Cortes in Mexico and Pizarro in Peru ignored the orders of their Spanish superiors in the New World. The British colonies in North America were likewise settled and expanded in piecemeal and often uncoordinated ways, typically by land purchase rather than military conquest in early colonial times. However, even in a given colony, such as Pennsylvania, the treaties made with the Indians by the Quaker leadership in Philadelphia were often ignored by the Scotch-Irish settlers on the western frontiers, who tended to settle on whatever land they found desirable, without worrying about whether it was inside or outside some line drawn on a map in Philadelphia. Given the Scotch-Irish tradition of occupying land they had not bought, whether in Britain, America, or Australia, this could hardly be surprising. Long after a growing population and an improving weapons technology put the Europeans clearly in the ascendancy throughout the hemisphere, there were still large frontier regions where Indians maintained their independence and their ability to fight. In 18th century Argentina, for example, Spanish frontier settlements were often subjected to Indian raids, during which captives would be taken away by the Indians, often to be either ransomed later or to be retained as slaves, including concubines for the Indians preferred capturing women and killing men, while children would be raised as members of the tribe. It was very common for Indian tribes to have Spanish captives, nor were the numbers involved negligible. During a long Spanish military campaign against the Indians in Argentina, more than 600 captives were freed. Their average period of captivity was nearly nine years, 
Much more common was the practice of paying ransom to get back individual Spaniards who had been carried off. Some Spanish men also escaped, but women were less likely to do so, and in fact, some women who were ransomed later returned to the Indian communities voluntarily, for their status in Spanish society was now degraded, since they were considered to have been dishonored by being concubines of Indians. The capture of whites and their retention among the Indians was not a phenomenon limited to Argentina by any means. A mid-eighteenth century report on the aftermath of Indian raids on European frontier settlements in western Pennsylvania stated, The Indian villages are full of prisoners of every age and sex. White women captured by the Iroquois likewise often chose to remain with them, because the white settler society from which they came also considered them ruined. The importance of the discovery of the Western Hemisphere by Europeans continued to be enormous, long after the age of discovery itself. 